All right. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to KCP community meeting March 1st and or February 29th, 2022. Um, we have some items on the agenda today. I don't know if, uh, if Stefan, you wanted to go uh, first and, and go through the, the sort of walkthrough you intended to do, or if we want to do regular business and give you the rest. I'm totally fine either way. I hope my content is pretty contained. Okay. Very quickly through. Yeah, let's let's, let's do yours and then and then with the rest we'll um uh we'll go through the rest of the business. In that case, I will stop presenting and give it back to you. All right. So I hope it's visible. Yep. All right, so um, that's a talk basically I, I gave internally and with some IBM folks before um, giving an overview to people who don't know KCP or have some vague uh, understanding what it might be, but everybody basically has his own view, projects his own um, use cases on it. And I try to, to yeah, give an overview of how we see that and the vision behind everything we are doing. We often lose ourselves in details as usual. Um, as engineers, this happens, but there's a big vision behind it. And I just want to repeat that. It's not for me, of course. Um, it's joint work by many people, it has evolved over time. And I just repeat basically uh, the learnings we did in the last months. If you start in KCP in the repository, you will find this. And before I go into that um, the disclaimer, when I say technically it is um, it's present tense, but lots of the things here are vision or direction. So it's not that the thing we are building at the moment is ready for 1 million workspaces. This is basically a goal and we are working towards that. So please take uh, it is um, in this sense. So if you go to KCP, um, there's a minimal generic CID API server, and I've heard many people who want just that and think KCP provides that. It does in a certain way. Um, there's something called logical clusters uh, inside of our cube branch. Um, basically, the goal is to host yeah, thousands, pretty smallish Kubernetes-like clusters, and I will go into details uh, in a few slides. But the basic idea is to host many clusters or Kubernetes-like clusters, like APIs, which look like a real complete Kubernetes cluster, but very, very cheap. Smaller maybe than usual um, big enterprise multi-tenant clusters, but cheap and super isolated. We'll go to, into that a bit more in a second. Um, the third thing is compute. Compute is different. Compute should be utility. And the mechanism we, we have here, we, we are working on is called transparent multi-cluster. And this basically allows us to attach an existing cube, OpenShift, AWS cube, whatever, some Kubernetes cluster as compute um, to a KCP. Not only one, but many, many of them, as many as you want in many regions and many clouds. Um, wherever you like, they must be cube compatible, obviously. It must be cube clusters. And the fourth thing is scale. So we are thinking uh, about yeah, some, some numbers here, 1 million workspaces, 10,000 orgs, 1,000 shards. That's basically the dimension we are talking about. Um, a question I, I get very often, um, especially from people who heard the project very early, is this Federation 3? Like, do we reinvent Federation? And there's a very super short answer. Federation is basically one to n. You have one app basically in your in your root cluster, and you federate that to n clusters um, in different regions, usually um, to get availability, for example, or to near to your users. This is federation when one to n. KCP is not one to n. KCP is n to one. At least the focus of KCP is n to one which means you have one cluster, one chart. It can host many, many apps, super isolated. You have shared compute, and on this shared compute, you run those apps. So it's N to one. Um, there's a but, obviously, KCP 
can and will get one to n, so federation as well, but it's something independent. It might be a feature on top. Um, the core ideas, the two core technical things we build at the moment, they are about n to one. Is KCP cube? Is KCP a fork of cube? Is it different than cube? Um, yeah, the simple slogan is KCP is cube. It's cube for service providers, like when you have many, many users, many apps, it's optimized for this use case. And um, it's cube, there's a star, um, there are some restrictions. For example, you don't see nodes, so I have the meaning here at the, at the bottom, you can access uh, a URL, set it as a cluster in your um, in the kube config. And under this URL, you can do everything you can do against a cube cluster. So you can deploy a deployment, you can get config map secrets. Um, you might be able to see pods, you can create your own CIDs, everything you expect from a cube cluster, but some things are not there. Nodes are, for example, not visible. So the, the goal is to have a complete um, cube experience, but um, not 100% in the sense that nodes are there and all low level types are there, but everything which matters. And nodes obviously usually don't matter for, for many, many use cases. That's the goal. So cube um, is our goal. KCP is cube. We use cube. The APIs are cube. Everything here is cube. So this is, this is very important. If you want to run 1 million, cube clusters, um, starting 1 million cube clusters, it's probably not the right solution. So we, we don't want to, to run 1 million controller managers, 1 million schedulers, 1 million everything, basically. We don't want that. So one decision here is um, yeah, very early, just by, by, the, by, by, by the size of the numbers, 1 million, we cannot just do many of the same, the many of the cube clusters we have. So our goal is, to have a cube user experience, but radically question how we reach this goal. So 1 million, that's a pretty big number, and you have to do things differently to reach that. And obviously, if you can do that, um, one goal is to make it cheaply. So cheap, cheap clusters, cheap workspaces, what the term is actually, is one of the core goals, and we'll see that in a second uh, a bit more. Um, analogy, in the in the first yeah in the years from from the beginning of the of, of, of the Linux kernel there was one kernel per cluster then uh, per, per 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 server eventually people did virtualization eventually they moved virtualization into the cube kernel which was then KBM um, and you could run many kernels on one, on one server and then something happened uh, a few years later Docker came around and what is different between Docker and KVM both do basically um, one to end one server, many applications. But there is, of course, a, a big difference. Everybody knows that. Uh, Edward remembers the first moment uh, seeing, seeing Docker, what it does. It's much cheaper because everything is faster and less, less, needs less resources, feels slicker, and it's developer oriented. So it's the same end to one or one to end but um, there is a big difference. And basically this is what we try to do with KCP and Cube. Um, if, you, if you run 1 million clusters, so the user basically sees their Cube URL. They can connect to the APIs and do whatever they like. Um, the outside view is Cube. Um, inside it might be very, very different. So that's why I, I painted it gray here. So, Inside, it's, it's Cube code. We reuse lots of the things that Cube has in the main repository, but we also do things differently. Um, for example, a shard is basically one API server or a triple of API servers uh, plus etcd plus storage. And we run many of those Cube workspaces, Cube clusters on one shard. So there is a one-to-n relationship between um, actual etcd clusters and um, what the users see outside. As I said before, compute is externalized, so compute is just utility. So we can attach many, many compute, compute clusters. Uh, yeah, could be OpenShift, could be EKS, GKE, whatever. Um, uh, some homegrown on-premise uh, cube cluster. You can attach them and you can run your workloads. And those shards make sure that workloads are scheduled onto those Yes, so-called real cube clusters, physical clusters is how we call them. 
physical because they, they, they have nodes and they can run the real pods. They're not just about the control plane and logical objects, they are about the real pods and about nodes and compute behind, storage behind, and so on. The bigger picture, of course, here is that this doesn't end with cube, but you have many, many services on top. So Kafka, SQL, NoSQL, monitoring registry, the usual things you, you can build on top as services. And KCP basically is a platform below that. So when you want to build such a system, super multi-tenant, so many, many users, and you want to offer services, this is the use case, the main use case for KCP. So um, let's zoom in a bit about hosting smallish Kubernetes-like clusters. Um, magnitude smaller. If you look on, on applications, how applications look like in Cube, uh, usually many applications, they are in the 50 uh, resources, so there are 50 or maybe 100 resources for one, for one application, but there are many of them on one cluster. Usually there are namespaces to separate them and you run uh, those in namespaces, but um, multi-tenant, yeah, it has limits. Everybody knows that. It's hard to get right. People try it, OpenShift try it, and it kind of works, um, but it's still a very complex system which uh, you get out of that. And in KCP, a workspace basically replaces all of this trouble. A workspace is something like a namespace, but um, by design, very deep in the, in the API server and the API machinery, we make sure that a workspace is very independent or super independent from other workspaces. Uh, everybody knows that, and this is basically the, the third point here, um, CRDs are cluster-wide. So if, if one application wants a certain manager of a certain, certain revision, a certain version, um, another one needs another one, this does not work. You can only install one version of a CRD in the cluster. Um, workspaces are independent. So you can have uh, one version of a CRD for cert manager in one workspace and a completely different one in another workspace. Um, there is no overlap in objects in any way. Um, workspaces are cheap. That's what we talked about already a couple of times. Um, our goal basically is the rule of thumb, a new workspace should be created in the tens of kilobytes. Basically, there is a definition of object for, uh, for a workspace called cluster workspace uh, in, in, the, in the code base at the moment. When this exists, you can use your workspace. And basically, this object is all which is stored in, in KCP for this moment. At the moment, you create data inside of a workspace. Of course, it, it grows. But um, the overhead for having workspaces instead of namespaces um, is it's basically not there. Like workspaces have the same cost as namespaces. That's the goal here. Um, authorization, it's another thing which we try to do different. And one reason why multi-tenant is hard because people want to do certain things and need permissions. On the other hand, you have to restrict them because of security, obviously. Isolation to other users and uh, visibility, leaking of information, you don't want that. Our goal is by design, everybody should be able to be admin in their workspaces, basically be able to do everything they want, like install CRDs, install something with Helm. Everybody should do that self-service in their workspaces. They're basically administrator, um, and they don't have to ask anybody, complete 100% self-service. Um, there might be restrictions which we have to at, like if you subscribe to APIs from a service provider, like there's a, um, there's a cert manager, um, as our running example, a cert manager provider um, who gives you an API for certs, then this, this um, service provider should be able to restrict certain, um, certain things, like you shouldn't update status of objects which are served or uh, given to you by a cert manager from the platform. So there are some restrictions, but um, other than that, you are admin. You can do everything you like. You can do role bindings, roles. Um, you are admin. That's, that's as simple as that. Um, if you go to the repository, so I, I got uh, I talked to people and they asked me, is this ready for production? Can I just use that for whatever use case? Um, there is a big warning in the in the readme at the moment. This is a prototype. It's not even a project. We are slowly migrating or moving into this project uh, 
face of the of the KCP. Um, you see that in the meeting in the meeting here, it's growing, and then more people are slowly moving from feasibility studies into something usable, like the APIs are evolving, and we are trying to make them, um, yeah, turn them into something that can stay, the, that we don't have to change too much. Everything is still V1 Alpha 1, so to be clear about that. Um, but we are moving into a direction that this becomes a project people can build on. Uh, our main focus at the moment, visibility is mostly clear for many things. But we have to, of course, we have to approve the value proposition. I mean, why do we do all of this? Um, and we try to get this ready for, for early external uh, consumption to prove that those concepts and those goals and the vision make sense. Um, for those who, who have not um, tried to use KCP themselves, so I, I mentioned workspace all the time. A workspace is basically a cube cluster. There are many of them in, in KCP. And a cube cluster is something which has discovery, which has open API, which has namespaces, and a couple of resources like contract maps, secrets, ABAC, CRDs. Basically, a workspace is something you can use kubectl against, and you get what you expect from a cube cluster. You can say kubectl API resources, you see everything. You can apply or create a CRD, and you create a CRD, and you can use custom resources against it, everything like that, that's what you get from a workspace. Workspaces are hosted in organizations. That's one, one separation to just um, get to one million objects. That's the main motivation here. It's also, um, yeah, it's a separation or it's a, it's a borderline between access probably in the future. So if you are in one organization, you cannot access other organizations with the same token. So there might be some implications on that. But basically, workspaces are part of organizations. And yeah, the, um, the user experience, this is a sketch. Not everything here is real yet. I got asked about kubectl login. There isn't such a thing. No, there isn't. Um, but the user experience is like that. You log into KCP um, with some login command. This might look a bit different. Could be KCP login eventually. You can go to some workspace index where you can see the workspaces you have access to. So the SS kubectl workspace enter thing, you enter an index, you get the workspaces, you see all the workspaces you have access to. So the default one, which is my, in my case would be my, my home uh, workspace, uh, Stefan, um, the index itself and all the applications I have, my app as an example. And you can um, create another one, you can create a workspace, you can enter it, you can create deployments in it, and you can switch between workspaces very easily via uh, simple commands. That's basically the vision of UX. Sharding is a thing. Obviously, one entity cannot host all the data, so there must be something like um, location of workspaces on shards. Uh, the, the big vision is that as soon as you have a kube config for workspace, this will always work. And I said in the beginning, kube or KCP is kube for service providers. Service providers might be interested in moving workspaces around. Like one shard is busy because there is a very noisy workspace on it, which needs lots of resources. Uh, let's call it A in this example. And your workspace B is, is there, but um, the SLOs promised by the system cannot be uh, satisfied anymore. So the so write rate is not just enough on this etcd. So your workspace B should be moved to another shard. This is a, it's a core use case which we want to implement here. And you as a user, you have your kube config. You can still work, maybe even live without noticing. And your workspace now is on a, on a different shard, on a different etcd, and everything keeps working. From the outside, it's invisible. CRDs for service offerings, they are limited. So one big topic we have is about um, life cycle of published APIs. So if you have, if you are a service provider, so you provide, for example, Postgres as a service in KCP, you might want, um, I mean, you have to handle the life cycle of your CIDs, which you offer to customers. So you, you want to offer a Postgres CID, for example, and now you roll out a new version. Um, this must be handled somewhere, somehow, somewhere. And, um, CIDs are just not enough for that. So one big, um, 
work item we have and we are actively working at the moment on that for the next prototype the first steps into this direction is api exports so basically you can publish apis with semantics with behavior to other users other workspaces in the kcp instance and um, there are many many details here uh, we can show it in a different uh, session obviously and you, you will see it, uh, some of that in the next uh, in the next prototype so stay tuned um, there are many topics which are deep important new research like i listed a, a few of them here um, etcd is not set in stone for example there is work to evaluate other things api import export i, I just mentioned Cube is not a, well, this shouldn't be a fork of Cube. We try to do as many things as possible with, with the normal upstream Cube uh, repository. We try to upstream things which we have to build in. We try to be modular against Cube, like extend it in a way that we don't have to fork Cube. So forking Cube, is an, it's, it's a non-goal, an anti-goal of what we are doing here. Um, enabling the client ecosystem. so. If you offer a service like a Postgres, you want to operate on many workspaces, not only one. So you need something like a client, like Informas, which can work against many workspaces in parallel, even with one instance of an operator. And enabling this in the ecosystem is one goal. Um, quota is getting much more complicated here. Quota accounting, also throttling QPS, so a write rate is guaranteed. Um, all those things become complicated, more complicated than Cube when you think about cross chart. If you're in one etcd, you have one consistent domain, things are pretty easy. But if you want to go cross chart, things get much more complicated. Um, yeah, this is this client ecosystem thing for multi workspace, it has one one angle, which is interesting. At the moment you go cross chart with one informer, this informer must be resilient to charts which come and go workspaces which are not available for some time so it's, uh, informers need awareness of workspaces basically and sharding and this is its own pretty complicated topic which is yeah it's basically the next step after uh, step four here and this is um, to go multi-shard um, multi-region these kind of things and this brings us to the last topic here to, uh, topology awareness um kcp is something which should run multi-region in a way. So those shards are, are distributed uh, over many, many data, cent data centers and topology becomes a thing in Cube. It's not really, it's, it's somehow in, in scheduling to a degree, but um, here it's becoming a much more core concept. And we are thinking about how to make this visible, for example, to, to operators which yeah, in this example, if you, if you provide Postgres, Postgres instances, you want to know what the topology is. And maybe you're not the one defining the topology because the KCP platform does that. So there's a big topic about how to make that visible to, to controller authors, for example. Um, yeah, everybody who's here knows that already. Um, maybe not all of that. There's a Google group. So if you want to read documents um, which we work on, those are usually shared to this Google group. So just join that um, and announcement of new docs are there and you can just uh, join the discussion and contribute. You're welcome to do that. Um, the KCP repository everybody has seen and the last thing maybe not everybody knows about there is a YouTube channel where you can re rewatch old recordings of uh, the community call which we are doing at the moment. All right, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was a, a very deep, but also very succinct uh, overview, which which is quite an achievement. Uh, this also makes me want to have a shorter link for our YouTube channel, because I don't think anybody can or should have to copy that down from from uh, your handwriting. I'll, I think we own kcp.dev somewhere. Uh, maybe Clayton does. We could get like youtube.kcp.dev or something. Um, but yeah, thank you. That was that was awesome. Yeah, go ahead. There's a there's a question from Ahmed. I wanted to ask about the user experience specifically. What is um, what is set in stone, and what is and what can what can adapt? For example, in in Knative, 
when they wanted to try to address the um, uh, the user experience for uh, stateless workloads, they started from uh, we need a container and we will give you a URL. And that I can see here that it's centered probably around the core uh, APIs like uh, pods and uh, services, etc. But for example, something like a workspace or an API export are a little bit different. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand ma mainly what, what is set in stone and what can change or what is the target um, MVP user experience you're trying to give? I guess formally we are still in the prototype phase, so things can change and input is welcome. I think the vision, like the goal, what we have here, this is mostly set in stone, like 1 million workspaces is our goal. It's not to have uh, giant single clusters. So this is pretty much set in stone, but how we do that, how we make those things visible, um, discussions are open. I mean, API import exports, it's a new topic. We are prototyping the API at the moment. Same thing with workspaces. Um, the API is not fixed, so it might change. At the moment, we don't guarantee that even the, the resource names stay, like persistence of data is not guaranteed. We are not there yet. Yeah, I'd, I'd say also the like the CLI user experience is entirely, you know, uh, flexible. If uh, that will change like all the time uh, before we come to any solid uh, solution. Also, Knative should run on top of this. So, like, if you're talking about like what is the experience for a person who just has a container and wants it to run somewhere and doesn't care where, I think our solution would be put Knative into into KCP, and now you get that. You know, also cross cluster, also you know, scheduled to who knows where. Yeah, work pattern. The key pattern here is someone can take a cube app and deploy it to clusters and not care. That's like the first pattern. There is a second pattern, which is teams can define a set of the set of APIs that they want, what kind of context they want to work in. So, like uh, in a workspace, you get a set of APIs. What is that set of APIs? It could be Knative plus service bindings plus generic DB construct or you know Kafka as a service topic APIs, that would be an event driven. That second and third, there's like a couple that people have thought through or brought up. Those aren't really being actively focused on right now, but those should guide. Like that's where like people should be able to say like, oh, I like crossplane, but crossplane should be able to hit 50x the scale and also have a whole bunch of ergonomics. But it's, you know, to do that, you either have to write your own API front plane or you live with Cube's limitations. Ah, if only there was some project going and trying to really break down Cube's limitations. So cross-plane, some of the things cross-plane is doing, they have like three or four different use cases. Any of those would potentially be like good second or third examples. And then really concrete examples from community of like Tekton is one example where, you know, Jason spent some time saying, if you wanted to do Tekton as a service, what would it kind of look like where you wanted to mostly hide the details of where builds run, but you still wanted those builds to have access to the parts of your app that you care about, right? Like when I run a build on Cube, I get a nice benefit of it can go call services and I can do nice integrations and I can stand up pods that run little mini test databases. What are the fundamental elements of that? That if you worked at the higher level, you'd be like, we're going to strip all the other stuff away, the accidental complexity and be like, I can create a pipeline, a Tekton pipeline, and it does stuff. And I can connect it to my services, but aha, it doesn't have to be in the same cluster. Yeah, does that, does that, uh, I don't know if that was an answer yeah. exactly, but does that satisfy your your question? Yeah, I, I know it's not it's not something that, 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 that have an easy answer. I think I'm more interested in what are smaller concepts that maybe People like uh, folks who worked in Knative maybe can import as or upstream into KCP, for example, something like addressable services or something like that. And what are that are going to be on top of KCP? So I know this is not something that can be finalized right now, but yeah, thanks. That that was that was good to know. Thank you. It would be awesome 
if there were good working groups that we could organize in the community to really chase some of those. Um, I know like everybody's kind of chasing kind of the core scenario right now, but I would like, I'd love to see like a, try to get a couple of people have some time to really like think through these and like actually spend some time, like come back as a, as a, Hey, we went and thought about this and are we getting the right guidance? Do we have the right, are we thinking what, what can be done? What has been considered and actually have that be a community artifact. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks a lot. Um, great. Any more questions about the uh, presentation or anything that jumped to anybody's mind? All right. Uh, thank you again for, for putting this together and for, for um, uh, sharing it with us. I think I actually want to, when this meeting goes up, I want to put a link to this on our readme because this is the, the current latest snapshot of what we think we're doing. I think the last video we had about this was, you know, maybe almost a year old. So um, this is great. Um, great. Uh, there are a few more items on the agenda. Um, do you mind if I try to take over rest control? Our folks, I think it's coming up. Uh, all right. Um, so, I, Paul, I think in one of in uh, one of the Slack channels, uh, said that it might be useful to go over issues filed since last week with no milestone, or or I think Andy said just all issues with no milestone. I'm kind of. I think this is helpful and useful to do. I would just wonder if uh, you know, since we have such a packed agenda, maybe we'll bump it to the end and use any remaining time on that. Um, unless other folks disagree. And if we don't have time to get to it, I will just do it offline in the Slack channel and uh, uh, you know maybe bump it to next week. Um, there's There was some discussion around the priority of deploy an application uh, service account kube configs point to KCP. I need to stay in this tab where it doesn't present. Uh, and I think that the question was basically, this was bumped from P2 or priority, uh, prototype two to prototype three, which we are now in, but it's not currently, uh, I think, being prioritized for prototype three. Uh, I think we all know it's something we need to do for something. <laughs> it's, it's something we need to do. I think the question is really, is it going to be a prototype three thing or is it going to be a prototype four plus? The longer we bump it, the more on fire it gets. So we should probably uh, address it before prior, you know, prototype nine or whatever. Does anyone have any more to say on this? I can go into sort of more detail about what it is, but if there's anybody, yeah, Andy, go ahead. I th I think we should try to prioritize this. If it means we have to de-scope and defer something else, then so be it, or maybe we have enough people to work on it, but this is an experience blocker where you can't just deploy something to KCP that needs to work with CRDs and have it work. Right. Yeah. This is this is a uh, you can't deploy a controller to KCP because it will just get scheduled to its. Well, depending on what you are syncing, it will get scheduled to a physical cluster and, at most, successfully talk to its physical cluster API server and things will go weird. Um, so yeah, I guess the the next question that falls out of that is is there anybody who is interested in doing this or anybody who wants to deprioritize anything else in favor of this? I'm kind of waiting with, uh, well, for other things to unblock. So I could take this one. Okay. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, you and I, you and I can work on this one. I think the thing you're currently yeah. blocked on is, uh, in the topic of the registration, physical cluster registration, there's some stuff we know we have to do um, uh, for setting up the service account token and getting the service account token um, ferried down to the cluster so it can do stuff in the KCP layer. Um, uh, Stefan, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to highlight, this is something, we, I mean, you see the items here like eight or nine, we can work on that and make progress. 
there's no reason to decide whether we don't work at all or we try to get it in. Just do progress. I mean, we, we have certain things here. Work on them. Um, yeah. They don't harm, I think, most of them in the code if they are just half done. Right. They might. Uh, I think what you're saying is these might not all be done by prototype three, but at least having some of them done will be useful progress. And then we can finish up whatever's left yeah. in the next one. Um, that sounds good to me. Does anyone object? All right. Ratified. Um, I would just add, if you feel like you're blocked on something, but you have an interest in this epic or other epics, please reach out on Slack, um, comment on the issue. You can tag me, Stefan. Um, I'm NCDC on GitHub. Stefan is STTTS. So um, we are here to help unblock and provide guidance and direction. So please feel free to speak up. Uh, all right, so uh, we're back in there. I hit back and it's not going. There we go. Um, all right, uh, Andy, do you want to talk about development process brainstorming? Yes, thank you. Um, so I was chatting with Stefan earlier today and uh, Paul as well and had some thoughts on how we can be a bit more transparent and trackable in what we're working on. So. Uh, the these are suggestions, not uh, set in stone. Um, so let's talk through them as a community and decide what we want to do. So my first suggestion is that uh, we do have actionable steps and action items like we do in 280 that we were just looking at. Also, I, I happen to link 418, but it's the same thing. So if you look under the action items, thank you, Jason, there's a lot of stuff in there to do. And ideally, these are um, each one may represent a single pull request. Maybe a couple of them would be combined into a PR. But um, ideally, we work together to uh, to flesh out the items for the epic, and um, they don't need to be converted into individual issues. That would just create a ton of issues. I think it's um, probably. Uh, a bit fluid as to which ones become separate issues and which ones just stay as tasks. I think if there's something that's a very big feature that goes into uh, part of an epic, it, it probably makes sense to create it as a separate issue. But um, you know, we'll talk about those on a case by case basis. But ideally, we work together to flesh these out, and then as folks are starting to work on them. My ask would be that you put your name, uh, your, your GitHub handle, next to a task that you are planning on working on. When you uh, open up a pull request, link the pull request as well. And when the pull request merges, uh, if GitHub doesn't automatically do it, just go in and, and check the box. And if you don't have permission to do any of those things in GitHub, just reach out on Slack or comment in the issue. And uh, one of the folks with right access will do it. So, um, so that's that's item number one. And Jason, if you go back to the other tab, uh, although I got my own copy here. Um, so the next thing is, uh, we all kind of bounce around at times and find new and exciting things to work on. And my ask would be that uh, if you do find yourself working on some unplanned or untracked work, meaning it's not a GitHub issue, it's not a task in an epic. That's totally cool, uh, but we at least want to know about it and be able to track it. So um, please file an issue for it. Please, uh, when the PR is open, mark it as fixing the issue. Uh, this is just to make sure that uh, for those of us who, who do need to take a look and see uh, you know, <laughs> what's going on and who's doing what, it's a little bit more visible uh, if we can do this. Related to that, is number three, making every effort possible to set the in-progress label on whatever you're actively working on. I personally don't do a great job of it, but it does help uh, just to, to see what's going on. So uh, my ask would be to try and remember. And then um, the last two are around milestones. So if you have filed an issue and you are confident about the target milestone, please set it or ask for it to be set. 
and then the same thing for pull requests. And that's what I had for today. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. I think I always I always forget to set milestones on PRs. That is something I wish GitHub could just automate for me, but alas. Uh, is there anybody any questions about any of this or clarifications? So I, I think I will open up a pull request against our contributing doc, which if you haven't seen it yet, there is a contributing .md file. Um, it's uh, fairly new and uh, can probably be augmented and fleshed out a bunch, but you have some place to start. So I'll open up a PR and add these items there. Uh, comments are welcome. And if there's anything else that you'd like to see in the contributing doc, please feel free to open PRs as well. Thanks. Nice. Um, yeah, sounds good. Uh, so we have, speaking of uh, uh, making every effort possible, sorry, uh, uh, putting things into milestones, um, going back up the list to, I guess we'll start with the most recently filed ones and then we can go back with the rest of them um, with our 17 remaining minutes. Um, need a way to filter out community meetings from this list, but that's fine. Um, Andy, you want to just talk about setting up CI for KCP Kubernetes, KCP DF Kubernetes, our fork? Yeah. Um, so as we've made code changes to our fork of Kubernetes, we uh, have not necessarily made sure that the unit tests compile, that the end to end tests compile. And um, it would be nice at the very least if everything compiles, bonus points if everything passes. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, what sort of infra we can potentially use for running E to E tests, but I at least think the unit tests could go through GitHub Actions. So uh, this would be nice to be able to do. And this was from a conversation with Steve, um, who, yeah, uh, <laughs> forget the tests. But yes, this that's uh, a long term priority. Uh, I don't know that it it needs to be in priority or in prototype three. So um, maybe prototype four. Or I also I created a milestone or renamed a milestone to TBD. And the purpose of TBD is it means we've looked at it, we've talked about it, we know we want to do it, but we don't have a particular prototype in which we have a, an assignment for it. Yeah, I guess. Uh... My question would be if is anybody interested in picking this up on a timeline like prototype three? And if not, is anybody interested in doing it in four? And if not, let's TBD it. Nobody assuming that the get GitHub actions can can do it. Um, I'll probably take a look at it before uh, trying to merge any of the CRDB stuff. OK, yeah, and I mean, like, you know, crawl before you run. It can just run go build first. Uh, That's and... old that is needed, yeah. <laughs> that would be Don't... excellent. The, the downside here is just, like, it doesn't compile. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, yeah, if if, uh, if you discover that that means it doesn't compile, now it's on you to fix it, right? Yeah. Uh, I should have mentioned that grenade before I asked people to jump on it. Um... <laughs> you speak up, it's yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to tentatively assign you, Steve, and put this in prototype three. Feel free to undo both of those actions if. Cool. Sounds good. Either. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. These are, I think, just a couple of like cleanup, cleanupy type things. We have uh, a number of places where we're doing sync checks. It's just kind of a refactor. Oh, we already have a PR open for this one. In that case, I'm going to request my own review, move this to milestone right at prototype three. Any uh, Anything else on this one except for just doing that? Is, uh, is Rito here by any chance? I don't think so. Well, anyway, thank you. If you're watching this on the recording later, thank you for doing that. Uh, 
Why is everything terrible? Um, this is another should be sort of easy one. Yeah, nice. Nice. I love to see it. Okay, I'm going to put this one in a milestone three and request my review and take a look at that soon. Man, we should do this all the time. Look at all the all the free work we're getting. Uh, Kyle, you filed this one about the system authenticated group. Um, yeah, I think I haven't had a chance to review uh, Sergius's responses, but I believe um, it's just me figuring out workspace and org stuff um, and the new access stuff that you do to get that sorted. OK. Uh, but this is just just a small feedback item. I think this is good initial sort of like experience feedback as well. Like what we have to think about generally how good we want to make sort of like the default experience. Like what we have prototyped so far is definitely not like 100% in sync what we have in Cube today. Like we have invented like this authorization scheme where you grant access against the content sub resource if you forget about it or if you don't see it it may be not obvious why you don't see things. So I guess it's it's also a good point to think about um, user experience as well. Just two cents from my side. Can you can you describe a little more how this is different than what happens in Kube? I don't think I know uh, enough about how that works over there. Right, if you look at my command, right, what um, Kyle tried to do is like, in order to make kubectl API, like the very last command on my side. Um, yeah, exactly there. What Kyle tried to do is like, if you have basic access to KCP and you're like literally just system authenticated from a kube perspective and you do kubectl API resources, like you're expected to, it, to just work if system authenticated is um, bounded against the system discovery role, right? That's that's sort of like standard cube. Mm -hmm. The things that you have to add currently on top of that is the two last paragraphs on the YAML that I added there. So you have to grant also, in this case, to the um, default workspace of the root cluster, also mm -hmm. basic access permissions to authenticated users, such that they can see the content of the default workspace of the root cluster, including things like discovery, um, right? So that's the things that is on top. That is the delta to standard gotcha. cube, so to say, at least in the current iteration, right? So right. Uh, I picked also you, Andy, on this one, um, and obviously Stefan. It's it's a thing that gives me a little thought that you know might be worth reiterating how we can make this a little easier in the future. It's not obvious if you're coming from cube. Makes sense? Yeah, thank you. I think the the, yeah, we do more than what uh what, than what Kube does today because we have this other level of stuff we have to grant you access to. Precisely. In addition yes. to the, okay. I wasn't I wasn't sure based on your description before whether we were doing something more than Kube does within the same bounds. No, we're doing uh more because we have more bounds. Um but yeah. Correct. The the workspace abstract, abstraction level sort of like at least today forces us to like a little at an additional stanza for authorization, yes. Right. Um, do we think that this is something that is a prototype three thing? It sounds like, it, uh, based on what you said, it sounds like we at least understand the problem and is maybe just a documentation of. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, it's documentation. I would definitely want to contribute an authorization markdown readme um, in the KCP um, thing. Uh, we already have a big list of what we want to do in prototype three four and five even for authorization together mm -hmm. with Stefan. So um, yes, but it's, it might be good to have a marker as a reminder. I'll make sure to add it to the doc that we have created of, of tasks and to-dos. OK, I'm going to also tentatively assign you this and put it in prototype three. It sounds like there is a lot of stuff that will spill over out of prototype three, but at least some of it can be done uh, in that time. Does that sound, does that sound OK? Yes. Yes, so oh, it's, it's already assigned. Thanks. Perfect. Um, all right. 
don't know why the back button doesn't work. There we go. Awesome. We did it, everyone. High five. Um, and I just added a more, more of them. A shout out at the uh, end. Um, Sergius just mentioned authorization MD. We have a docs uh, folder, and I think we should start documenting the at least a big, big epics which we implement. Like authorization is not obvious. Everybody knows that and has just seen it. Workspace is the same thing. Um, so the concepts we are building, they become non-trivial. So let's use this folder and add your markdown files with design background, basically. Yeah, I think like specifically, this is stuff we do that that is beyond what what Kubernetes already does. We're like, I don't want to have like a copy of all of Kubernetes docs in here, but the the specific KCP workspaces are a whole new concept with a whole new set of stuff, and the way we do auth as a result is uh, more complex. So yeah, that sounds that sounds good. Thank you. Authorization MD already in the works. Uh, all issues with no uh, milestone. We're probably not going to be able to get through all of these, but we might as well. Might as well try. Um, conditions deep copy. Andy, do you know? Oh, this is related to generators outside of uh, GoPath. I, I stuck it in there um, just because I, I, that's when I discovered it. I could split it if needed, but there's a PR open for it. Oh, it's uh, it's not specifically related to generators outside of GoPath, but the fix for that also covers the fix for. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Uh, great. I'm going to put that in milestone three because I think we'll get it there. Prototype three because I think we'll get it done. Um, uh, David. You're here, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so this one, I don't really know what we want. I mean, it mainly depends on what we expect from uh, personal workspaces. At the time I created the issue, I mean, the distinction between workspace and, you know, externally visible workspaces and the cluster workspace, which is mainly um, the implementation of it based on sharding. On, on, on the workspaces that live on shards. Uh, this distinction was not, you know, done. So currently in the workspaces that are available from this endpoint, from the virtual workspace, um, there is nothing to, to, to update, in fact, in the spec. So, okay, I mean, I, I think at least the priority of this is probably quite low um, until we know, I mean, if we want to surface in the externally visible workspace object in the public workspace object if you want to surface things in the spec that would be common to all implementations and that could be you know updated then probably this would become more a higher priority but for now i think it's quite low one does it make sense do we need this for prototype three i assume no okay so um, let's put tbd on it sure I just noticed the TBD is do nine nine ninety nine. I tried to do ninety nine ninety nine and it wouldn't let me. <laughs> that's that's ludicrously far in the future. No one would ever have an issue that far in the future. Twenty ninety nine though, totally. Uh, same question for watch. Is this is this the same? I basic don't issue? think it's especially related to prototype three. It might be. Uh, it might still be, in fact, um, I'm wondering just today if I'm not going to add that um, in, the, in the context of integrating, you know, organizations um, into the personal workspace endpoint. And this is part of prototype three, I assume. Uh, so, so you're saying this is, a, this is a prototype three thing? Yeah, indirectly, I mean, okay. at least but that would probably be fixed uh, while working on, on prototype three uh, issue, which I did not create because it's, you know, related to Stefan work on organizations last week, I'm updating the workspaces, virtual workspace. And in the context of this work, possibly the watch support would be added, uh, but, you know, just indirectly. 
So it's not a must, but it can just come with other changes. Yes, it, it might be that adding this watching code, you know, helps implementing also the, the organization support in the workspaces, virtual workspace, in which case I will do it because it's easier. Cool. Um, end to end to ensure Kubernetes namespace controller is functional. Yeah, without going into too much detail, like we may or may not use the namespace controller from upstream, like we'll have something, but it may be something different. So um, this is a, an experience and probably data integrity thing. So when you go to delete a workspace, you need to make sure all the content's deleted in the workspace and in all the namespaces. Um, I would call this an experience blocker. And I don't know that we're going to have time to get to it in P3, but I'd want to consider it for four. OK, uh, I will I'll put it in four. And if later we decide to move it, that's totally fine. Um, JSON schema compatibility checker. This is on all the schema compat stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that. This is required for P3, I don't know. No, it's, I'm going to say I, I no. Think in, yeah. in P4, we will rethink those topics for API imports, exports. We will use this code, obviously. We have some schema evolution API in mind. So we, we will come back to that in four or five, but it's not must for the moment. Yeah, yeah we, we need to be pretty ruthless and have a very high bar for adding something to prototype three today. I've, I've done that a few times already. I'm sorry if that's it. <laughs> um, mainly because I thought we would already get them done. Um, uh, this, is there a fix for this? No, this is a Kubernetes thing. Oh, right, right, the, the defaulting, mm. yeah. It's not required for prototype three. Yeah, definitely. I'm just sort of, mm. but it, it does go to some of the defaulting and validation and webhook stuff that we've talked about before. I'm going to TBD it for now, but. Um, and maybe it's a good first issue, independent upstream, uh, if sure, somebody sure. wants to contribute. Um, all right. Uh, with that, I mean, I, we can, I can keep going through these after uh and ping folks if i have any questions about them but i think it would be nice to get these either done or deprioritized or uh closed some of them may be closed yeah um, if, if you want to do it async that's cool if we want to have it be the first item in next week's agenda just for anything that's left over uh, we could do that too yeah i think it's i think uh i forget who said it who who proposed it but i think it's a good idea every week to have like housekeeping as the first or as one of the standing topics. Um, but first, we have to like clean the house so that every weekly housekeeping is small. Yep. Um, all right. Well, great. Unless there's any late breaking news, I'll see you all next week or on the internet until next week. Bye, everyone.